Well, praise God. Welcome today to our session. I believe you're going to be thrilled. I want you to listen and listen because what I say to you can change your life, your family, and whatever church you belong to. Change our nation. It is very important. It's called, Can You Find Time to Pray? 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17 says this, Pray without ceasing. That means be unceasing in prayer. Praying perseveringly. Now, I believe today that some of you in your spirit have sensed in these days a call to prayer. God, through the Holy Spirit, is calling all of us to spend more time in prayer, making it a higher priority in your life. Now, how do I know? Because he's been telling me the same thing. In fact, the more I talk about it, the more convinced I am that God is calling all of his people to prayer. It is vital. The reason is very simple. These are the last days. Are you listening to me? God is ready to move through us in a magnificent and a supernatural way. But he can't do that if we are not walking in the Spirit. How can he work through people who are so busy with the affairs of life that they can't even hear his voice? God needs people today who will pray, not just when they happen to think about it, but every day. He needs people who will build their lives around prayer and make it their number one priority. Have you ever noticed how Jesus he operated when he was on the earth. He placed great importance on prayer. You know, the night before he chose the 12 disciples, he was in prayer all night long. Well, Jesus didn't do the things one way and tell us to do it some, something else. He expects us to follow his examples. Now, we just read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, where it tells us to pray without ceasing. Now, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, it also tells us to pray, always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Now, all through the New Testament, there are many references where we're told to pray. And now it's time for us to do our job. I don't mean just one or two of us. I mean, as much as possible, the whole army of God, worldwide. You're probably thinking, hey, I hardly have time to handle all the crises in my life as it is right now. I can't afford to spend any more time in prayer. But the truth is, you can't afford not to. It's very important. You need to understand what time spent with the Father can do for you. You need to spend time. That's what we all should do. Could we give at least an hour a day of our time just in the Word and in prayer? If we could do that, surely all would begin to be well with us. And not only with us, but I believe we would become a blessing then to the people around us. Now, Jesus has made the same promise to you. It's right there in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. I'll just read it to you. Now, this is what the Holy Spirit is saying to us now. And we know that all things, hear that? All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Called according to his purpose. Now, most people take that verse out of context. <coughs> Pardon me, and say the Bible promises that all things, including demonic things like sickness, death, poverty, work together for good, period. But that's not true. That is not true. If you back up and read the surrounding scriptures, you find that the promises follow a discussion about praying aided by the Holy Spirit where the Holy Spirit then makes intercession for us according to the will of God. Listen to this scripture. Remember this 
Romans 8, 26 says, He helps us to pray. Now, this is not something the Holy Spirit does without us. Now, the Amplified Bible, uh, Bible says this, He comes to our aid, He bears us up in our weaknesses, when we don't know how to pray as we ought, by His help, we pray in the Spirit, the perfect will of God. It's when we begin to make prayer our priority, to lay aside the natural things, take up the things of God, and walk in the power of the Spirit, that the glory of God then will be reflected in and through us. Now, if we want to have the power of God in our lives, we've got to stop spending all our time just thinking about ourselves, about our surroundings, our life, what we're doing day to day. We have to start giving ourselves to things that are going to make an eternal difference. We have, we have to start giving ourselves to prayer. Now you know, God hasn't put us here on this earth just so we could make it through life and then go to heaven. He's put us here so we can do his works just as his son, Jesus, did. John 14, 12 tells us, Jesus said this, we would do even greater works than he did. That means we can reach the whole world, every nation. Hmm? But we're not going to be empowered to do these things by just sitting around watching TV, spending all our time on social media like most people do. We're only going to be empowered to do them when we start making Jesus priorities, our priorities. When we start wanting what he wants more than anything else. Now God has got glorious plans for us in the spirit realm. But if we don't spend time in that realm, praying, listening to God, we're not going to get in on those plans. All of us have the ability to develop a point, to a point that we can listen to our spirit. Now in the past, I don't believe many people have operated in that realm very much. But I want to encourage you to try and believe you can. Now, how are we going to? Well, by praying in the Spirit and listening to God. The more we do that, the more accurately we will hear. Think of your spirit like a kind of inner communication, like a radio. Okay? Now, if you don't tune in, to it exactly to the right frequency, all you get is static and meaningless noise. Isn't that right? But if you can tune into that station exactly, everything then becomes loud and clear. God is wanting us to fine tune ourselves in the realm of the spirit. He's wanting us to tune our spirit so we can pick him up quickly and definitely. He wants us to be able to hear his voice so we can obey it. That makes sense, doesn't it? Now, most, however, haven't been willing to take the time to do that. They've been too busy to get quiet before him long enough to hear him say what he wants us to do. And that's why he's telling us to put prayer first, to make communication with him our top priority to shut out the world and spend time in prayer and in the Word. When we do that, he can begin to fine-tune our spirit to hear his voice. His voice is, in dis in, is indistinct to us because we spend so much of our time caught up just in natural things. Now, as we begin to come into this place of hearing, we'll be in one accord because Hearing will be in one accord because we'll all know what the mind of the Spirit is. We'll have our minds and hearts in tune with God's doing. And then when we come together, there, I, I believe there can be an explosion of God's power that will turn the world onto revival with Australia. I think it's time we believe we can become the top two. Amen? And that is called the power of praying in the Spirit. It's Bible. Now, many people tell you, oh, that was with the early church. It's finished. No, they're finished. 
God has never finished and God would never have put the instructions in there if it wasn't meant to be used. You need to learn to move in the Holy Spirit. Jude 20, Amplified Translation says, But you, beloved, build yourselves up, founded on your most holy faith, make progress, rise like an edifice, higher and higher, praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, how many of you know we all have various weaknesses? Now, it doesn't matter who you are, how strong you may be in the natural. If you are a born-again child of God, living on this planet Earth, you have weaknesses. It's a weakness that can take the wind out of your sails, just when you think you're going strong. It can cause you to act like a sinner on the outside, when on the inside, you're a saint. What is that weakness? Your flesh. The flesh and blood body you live in hasn't been reborn as your spirit has. It controls your life. It will take you from one failure to another. What you have to do is build up your spirit, strengthen it to the point where it can actually dominate and rule over you, your flesh. Now, if that sounds hard, don't worry, it's not. In fact, God has made it so easy that anyone can do it. Again, when we read in Jude 20, it will show you how. You, beloved, build yourselves up, founded on your most holy faith, make progress, rise like an edifice, higher and higher, praying in the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's in the modern translation, Amplified. Now, most believers don't realize it, but praying in the Spirit or praying in other tongues is a spiritual exercise that strengthens your inner man. That's the spirit man in you that's trying to rise up and be in control of the soul and the flesh. Now, if you will do it faithfully, it will help bring you to the point where your spirit will be able to keep that fleshly body of yours in line. Well, you may ask, why can't I just do that by praying in English? Because the Bible says weaknesses gets in the way. Now, many times in your natural mind, it doesn't have any idea how to pray as it needs to. It may not know how to pray prayers that will strengthen you against temptations that are coming your way. Now, your mind is not informed as your spirit is. Your spirit is in contact with God. That's why Romans chapter 8, verse 26, 28 says this, The Holy Spirit comes to our aid and bears up in our weaknesses, for we do not know what prayer to offer, nor how to offer it worthily as we ought, but the Spirit himself goes to meet our supplication, pleads in our behalf, with unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep for utterance. And he who searches the hearts of men knows what's in the mind of the Holy Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes and pleads before God in behalf of the saints according to and in harmony with God's will. Again, the Amplified Translation. So praying in the Spirit enables you to pray the perfect will of God for your life. It allows you to step out of the realm of the flesh and into the realm of the spirit so that no matter how weak or ignorant you may be in the natural, you can pray exactly as you need to. Think on that. Is it any wonder that speaking in tongues has undergone such persecution in our modern times? The devil hates it. He knows it's the only way believers can pray beyond what they know. By the way, the devil doesn't understand it when you pray that way either. God does. See, he understands, even if we don't, that even baby Christians, newly reborn, can pray in the Spirit, get the mind of the Spirit, and start growing quickly. That's the way the church at Jerusalem grew in the early days, you know. That's all they had. They couldn't turn to the book of Ephesians, the book of Colossians, the book of Revelation, or any others. They just had to use the ability and understanding that the Holy Spirit had given them. 
And when they did, they turned the whole world, they say, upside down. Now let me tell you something. This will turn your world upside down too. It will build you up. It will enable you to walk in the power of the Spirit instead of the weakness of the flesh. But be warned, it won't work for you unless you put it to work. Now, let's just say this. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He's not going to come demanding and making you pray in the Spirit. He's going to watch on and wait on you to decide to do it. He's going to wait for you to put your will in gear. Now, what happens if you don't? Well, you won't be prepared for when the trouble comes. Now, we've all just experienced something totally unexpected with this coronavirus lockdown. Coronavirus lockdown, all right? We need to be prepared with whatever the enemy is throwing at us. Now, in Luke chapter 21, verse 36, Jesus says this, Watch you therefore, pray always, that you may be accounted worthy, for as the Amplified Bible says, that you may have the full strength and ability to escape all these things that shall come to pass. So God is telling us that some things are going to come to pass, right? Now, if you want to have the strength and ability to come through troubled times in triumph, you'd better spend some time in prayer. That's what Jesus urged Peter and the other disciples to do in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knew they were about to face one of the toughest times of their lives. He said in Mark chapter 14, verse 38, Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but guess what? The flesh is weak. That's what it says, but the flesh is weak. So the scripture tells us they didn't obey him. They slept instead. And in Peter's life in particular, we saw the result. When temptation came, he entered into it. He even denied the Lord. Now, if you spent much time with the Lord at all, these instructions probably don't come as much as a surprise to you, right? So what God is trying to get through to us, that it is time to add to the word by praying much more in the Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 14 says this, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays. Your spirit, the Holy Spirit, where God resides. So if you begin to give prominence to your spirit, you will see much more flow out of it. Outflow. Giving prominence to your spirit is the way you walk in the spirit, just as giving prominence to your flesh is the way you walk in the flesh. The more you release your spirit through tongues, the more it begins to take charge. And you will find it works, just as the Bible says, Galatians 5, verse 16, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. You will find it easier to hear and obey your spirit, which is indwelt, indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Simple, isn't it? Sounds simple. It is. But the devil has tried to hide the simplicity of it from us because he knows if we ever start doing it, he'll have no place left. You see, he's limited. He can't touch your reborn spirit. The only thing he has to work on is your flesh. Once you learn what brings the flesh under dominion, under control, once you learn that praying the spirit applies spirit to the flesh and causes the flesh to begin to obey God the way it should. The devil won't be able to get a foothold in your life at all if you do that. But the benefits of praying the Spirit don't stop there. That is just the beginning. Exciting. Listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote about it. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. For he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto man, but unto God. For no man understands him. How come in the Spirit he speaks mysteries? What are the mysteries? Mysteries are things we don't know or understand. 
We, we don't just automatically know, for example, what the perfect will of God is for our lives, do we? We don't know exactly what part we've been called to play in the body of Christ. Some things we know, of course. We don't know exactly what steps to take and what moves each day we do to fulfill the plan that God has got laid out for our lives, and he has a plan for all of our lives. Nobody in the world can tell us, but Paul can. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 to 10 says this, and he got this by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I has not seen nor hear heard, neither have entered into the heart of men the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them to us by his Spirit. But how can I know all things he's revealed to me if I'm praying in a language I don't understand? They can't. That's why the Bible tells us to pray that we might interpret. As you begin to pray in the Spirit, ask God to give you an understanding of what he's saying. Now, I'll tell you what I do. and We'll all do things, what suits us and what we understand best. You know, if I'm driving in the car and I've got certain things I know I should be doing about my health or any other thing, finances, anything, I'll commit it to God, then I'll pray in the Spirit. And when I pray in the Spirit like that, I know that that is a coded message going to God. The devil doesn't know what I'm saying. But God does. And then God can begin to give me revelation where necessary. Do you understand that? It's important you do. So, that's why the Bible tells us to pray that way. And as you begin to pray in the Spirit, ask God to give you the understanding of what he's saying. Now, you might get the interpretation of that immediately. But eventually, it will come to you. It will begin to bubble up like an assurance in your spirit. You've got to learn to listen to your spirit man. Often it's a still small voice in there. There, not here. The knowledge comes there after here. See? You'll get an impression, a word, sometimes a sentence. You begin to get revelation on things you've never understood before. And that's what you need. Revelation from God. That's what we all need. But if we'll pray in the Spirit, we'll get into that area out beyond our knowledge and expectation. Now the Bible puts it this way in Ephesians 3, verse 20. Above all that we ask or think. Now I'll tell you this. If we all start praying the will of God by the power of the Spirit, God will be able to get mysteries into this earth. He'll be able to use our mouths, our authority to call forth his plan on the earth. And praise God, every one of us, from the least to the greatest, can participate because it's so simple. Every one of us can pray in the Spirit every day if we choose. Now that's once you've received the Holy Spirit, what we call the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So without doubt, if you will do it, it will one day prove to be the smartest thing that you ever did. Pray like the harvest of lost souls depends upon it. I believe that's the priority God's trying to say to all Christians now. The harvest is ripe. The laborers are few. Well, the laborers are sitting in the seats in the churches. It's time we went to the streets, to the people, to our neighbors, to our loved ones, etc. Now, 1 John 5, verse 14 to 15 says this. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. If there was ever a time we needed to pray, it is now. It's a time for prayer because the darkness of this world is going through. It's going through darkness, isn't it? Now Satan is killing people with diseases, drugs, depression, and every other weapon that he can get his hands on. It's time to pray because this generation of believers is in a very special time in history. We are almost at the end of a special age. The 6,000 years of man's lease 
and Satan's lordship on the earth are coming to a close. Now, I'm not saying the earth is only 6,000 years old, but I'm talking from Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden when God laid a special plan. Now, that 6,000-year period is almost gone. The church age is nearly over. But before Jesus comes, God will fulfill every promise he made during the 6,000 years of man's history on this planet Earth. Now, the body of Christ is about to have its hands full of the harvest. The key to seeing that kind of results that God wants for us in these last days, this generation is to walk in. It's not just praying about some random type of prayer and hoping that everything might just take place, happen. James wrote in James chapter 4, verses 2 to 3, You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and you war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your own pleasures. Listen, success comes when we pray accurately according to the will of God. Praying the will of God. Now, to really honor God, we must pray what he has already declared to be his will. Praying the will of God is the only kind of praying that can consistently, confidently be expected to bring results. We just need to grab our Bibles, find out what the will of God is. God's word is his will. Now, he's made some very specific promises in it and his will to fulfill every one of them. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 to 15 says this, now, this is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. So we need to find out what the word says. Now, you see, there are some principles working in the area of prayer. These same principles work in every area of prayer. Do you need healing in your body? Don't pray what the doctor says or what your re religious tradition may have told you. Pray, by his stripes, I am healed. 1 Peter 2.24 Do you have some financial needs? Don't pray your problem. Pray what God says he will do. Philippians 4.19 My God shall supply all my need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. God wants his will to be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Find the promises that applies to your situation and pray the answer instead of the problem. God knows everything. He knows your problems. You've got to get the answer and speak the answer. Don't just pray what you think the word of God says. Amen. Read it. Even if you read that promise a hundred times, read it again. Read on what it says again and again. One day, you'll find a familiar verse and suddenly God will give you the greatest revelation you've ever had in your life. And it will be exactly what you need to know how to pray effectively about your current situation. Remember we read in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 to 15, where it says, we are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. And since we know he hears us when we make our requests, we also know that he will give us what we ask for. When you pray God's word, knowing his will in advance, you are no longer praying, just hoping to get results. You're not just rattling off, you know, a whole lot of religious sounding words. You're praying, expecting to get results. See, God doesn't want you having organized prayer, religious words. God wants to hear from you, your heart, your mind, and speak words that are in agreement with his word. That's prayer. It's like conversation with God. Then you're praying accurately because you are praying the very words God has given as his will to be done on this earth. So before you pray, make the decision what you pray is going to get results. 
Then pray the word, expecting God to move. Now, Psalm 149, verse 5 to 6 say this, Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. doesn't matter if you wake up the next room. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. That's the word of God. Now, I know that by natural standards, that kind of exuberant praise doesn't seem very dignified. But as believers, we need to get past that because you're not dignified in the natural. We need to focus instead on pleasing God. Amen? Now, we should have such a desire to please him that we don't care how we look to other people. You may think that's easy for me because I'm comfortable with expressing myself you know, to God in praise. But I haven't always been that way. No one was. It took me quite a while to even begin to lift my hands in praise. But I broke through that embarrassment, and so can you. Although there's a time for a quiet type of worship, the Bible says joy isn't always quiet. In fact, joy can shout. Psalm 5 verse 11 says, But let all those that put their trust in you rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Wow. Now you may not know this, but when you get to heaven, it's not going to be quiet. The throne room of God, I read from Scripture, is a very noisy place. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1 to 4 tells us this. Listen to this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And he cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. What's that telling me? The throne room is a loud place that's filled with the glory of God. Living ones are crying, holy, 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 until the very doorposts shake. I'm telling you, God is not all laid back as some people think. You think on that, okay? He's not getting old. He isn't even slowing down. His very presence causes people to get so excited. They shout. Do you ever go to a football game, cheer and shout? Oh, you should get embarrassed. You shouldn't be doing that. You should be more dignified. No, you don't think about it. You let it go when your team's doing something special. See, is that normal? Certainly. Well, I think it's normal that we get excited about worshipping God too. Now, in the throne room, they think it's normal to cry, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. You'll be there one day and you'll say it. Amen? That's what's normal up there. Then we need to learn to act, to act down here as they act up there. We need to learn a holy shout. Now, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verse 37 to 39, tells us, about a time when the crowd began to praise God. It says, Then, as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they have seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Now, the Pharisees didn't like that kind of praise, but that's not surprising. Have you noticed the religious people in churches today? They don't like that. They think we should be all quiet and dignified. Well, I never was dignified. Okay, some of you may have been. But the thing was, when God came into my life, something happened and I couldn't help but express it. I don't get embarrassed by praising God. Amen? See, religious people don't like anything Jesus did because nothing he did fitted into their traditions. And since they lost the power of God in their lives, tradition 
was all they had and that's all many have today. But you need to get set free. When you lose contact with the power of God, you lose the excitement about worship. And that's exactly what happened to the Pharisees. How do you think Jesus responded? Do you think he restrained his disciples so they wouldn't offend anyone? No. He said, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. That's Luke 19, verse 40. Jesus never, ever tried to please the Pharisees. He only pleased God. He told them, if my disciples don't praise me, the rocks will do it. And that is what Jesus thinks about praise. Listen to me. Jesus is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. So let's start with his word and finish with his word. Amen? Give Jesus the first word in everything you do and watch him bring in a harvest like no previous generation has ever seen. And I tell you, when the church starts doing what the early church did and praying the Spirit, get into unity, believe they could take the world, they turn the world upside down in two years without modern media or anything else because they had the power of the Holy Spirit in them, working through them with the Word of God. God bless you today. Now I have some prayer requests just before we go. And uh, there's several here and there's a young man called Todd and uh, it says he's got a growth on his foot. Doctors don't know what it is, but he needs prayer. So he doesn't need the surgery. It's very painful for him to walk at the moment. Well, I tell you something, Todd, if you're watching this broadcast now, I'm gonna pray for you especially and all the others. But listen, Todd, believe God right now, as you watch this, I'm gonna speak the word of God God watches over his word to perform it. It will never return to him void, but always accomplish what it is sent out to do. I believe you're about to receive a miracle. In the name of Jesus, I loosen that growth from your foot, whatever is causing it. In Jesus' name, God, in Jesus' name, you cut it out. You take it out of him right now. Heal him in Jesus' name. Let him wake up tomorrow morning, whenever, and find out, hey, I'm free. I am free, because whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And the rest of you watching, whether you've got lumps, breast tumors, anything, deafness, blindness, lameness, pains in your body, sicknesses, I bind and break those powers in the name of Jesus, and I loosen you right now in Jesus' name to be healed. May the Lord bless you. Share this message with your friends. I think this is important the body of Christ hear what we've said today. And thank you very much for helping us and keeping us going.